Okay, gang. Stephen Hawkins, Black Holes and Baby Universes and Essays. We're going to read the ninth essay. Okay. Ninth essay. Uh, the Origins of the Universe from page 85. Okay. And again, this is a lecture uh, given at the 900th 900 years uh, of gravity conference held in Cambridge in June 1987 on the 300th anniversary of the publication of Newton's Princip Principia. Okay. <laughs> okay. The problem of the or origin of the universe is a bit like the old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? In other words, what agency created the universe and what created the agency, that agency? Or perhaps the universe or the agency that created it existed forever and didn't need to be created. Up to, up to recently, scientists have tended to shy away from such question, questions, feeling that they belong to metaphysics or religion rather than the, rather than to science in the last few years however it has emerged that the laws of science may hold even at the beginning of the universe in that case the universe could be self-contained and determined completely by the laws of science the debate about whether whether and how the universe began has been going on throughout recorded history basically there were two schools of thought many early conditions of the jewish christian and islamic religions held that the universe was created in the fairly recent past in the 17th century in the 17th century bishop usher calculated date of 4004 bc for the creation of the universe a figure he arrived at by adding up the ages of people in the Old Testament. One fact that was used to support the idea of a recent origin was the recognition that the human race is obviously evolving in culture and technology. We remember who first performed that deed or developed this te technique. Thus the argument runs, we cannot have been around all that long otherwise we would have already pro progressed more than we have in fact the biblical date for the creation is not that far off the date of the end of the last ice age which is when modern humans seem first to have appeared on the other hand there were people such as the greek philosopher aristotle who did not like the idea that the universe had a beginning they felt that would imply divine intervention. They preferred to believe that the universe had existed and would exist forever. Something that was eternal was more perfect than something that had been created. They had an answer to the argument about human progress described above. Periodic floods or other natural disasters had repeatedly set the human race right back to the beginning. Both schools of thought held that the universe was essentially unchanging with time. Whether it was created in its present form or it has endured forever as it is today. This was a natural belief because human life, indeed the whole of recorded history, is so brief that during, uh, that during it the universe has not changed significantly. In a static, unchanging universe, the question of whether it has existed forever or whether it was created at a finite time in the past is really a matter for metaphysics or religion. Either theory could account for such a universe. Indeed, in 1781, the philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote a mon uh, monumental and very obscure book, the critique of pure uh, pure reason in which he concluded 
that there were equally valid arguments both for believing that the universe had a beginning and for believing that it did not. As this title suggests, his conclusion conclusions were based simply on reason. In other words, they did not take any account of observations of the universe. After all, in an unchanging universe, what was there to observe? In the 19th century, however, evidence began to accumulate that the Earth and the rest of the universe were in fact changing with time. Geologists realized that the formation of the rocks and the fossils in them would have taken hundreds of thousands of millions of years. This was far longer than the age of the Earth as calculated by the creationists. Further evidence was provided by the so-called second law of thermodynamics formulated by the German physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. It states that the total amount of disorder in the universe, which is measured by the quantity called entropy, always increases with time. This, like the argument about human progress, suggests that the universe can have been going only for a finite time. Otherwise, it would not by now have degenerated into a state of complete disorder in which everything would be at the same temperature. Another difficulty with the idea of static universe was that according to Newton's law of gravity, each star in the universe ought to be attracted towards every other star. If so, how, how could they stay motionless at a constant distance from each other? wouldn't they all fall together? Newton was aware of this problem in a letter to Richard Bentley, a leading philosopher of the time. He argued that a finite collection of stars would not remain motionless. They would all fall together to, uh, to some central point. However, he argued an infinite collection of stars would not fall together, for there would be not be for there would not be any central point for them to fall to. This argument is an example of the pitfalls that one can encounter when one talks about infinite systems. By using different ways to add up the forces on each star from the infinite number of other stars in the universe, one can get different answers to the question of whether the stars can remain at constant distances from each other. We now know that the correct procedure is to consider the case of finite regions of stars and then add more stars, distributed roughly uniformly outside the region. A finite collection of stars will fall together according to Newton's laws. Adding more stars outside that the region will not stop the collapse. Thus, an infinite collection of stars cannot remain a motionless state. If they are not moving relative to each other at one time, the attraction between them will cause them to start, start falling together, e falling towards each other. Alternatively, they can, they can be moving away from each other with gravity slow, slowing down the velocity of the recession. Despite these difficulties with the idea of a static and unchanging universe, no one in the 17th, 18th, 19th, or early 20th century suggested that the universe might be evolving with time. Newton and Einstein both missed the chance of predicting the universe should be either contracting or expanding. One cannot really hold it against Newton because he lived 250 years before the observational discovery of the expansion of the universe. But Einstein should have known better. The theory of general relativity, relativity he formulated in 1915 predicted that the universe was expanding, but he remained so convinced of a static universe that he added an element to his theory to reconcil reconcil reconcile it with Newton's theory and balance gravity. The discovery of the expansion of the universe by Edwin Hubble in 1929 completely changed the discussion about its origin. If you take the present motion of the galaxies and run it back in time, it would seem that they should all have been 
on top of each other at some point between 10 and 20,000 million years ago. At this time, a singularity called the Big Bang, the density of the universe and the curvature of space time would have been f infinite. Under such conditions, all the known laws of science would break down. This is a disaster for science. It would mean that the science alone could not predict how the universe began. All that science could say is the universe is as it is now because it was at it as it was then. But science could not explain why it was it was just after the big what why it was as it was just after the Big Bang. Not surprisingly, many scientists were unhappy with this conclusion. There were thus several attempts to avoid the conclusion that there must have been a Big Bang singularity and hence a beginning of time. One was one was to one was the so-called steady state theory. The idea was that as the galaxies moved apart from each other, each galaxy and new galaxies would form in the space in between from matter that was uh, continuously being created. The universe existed and would continue to exist forever in more or less the same state as it is today. For the universe to continue to expand and new matter be created, the steady state model required a modification of general relativity, but the state of creation needed was very low, about, about one partic particle per cubic kilometer per year, which would not con conflict with observations. The theory also predicted that the average density of galaxies and similar objects should be constant both in space and time. However, a survey of sources of radio waves outside our galaxy carried out by Martin R Ryle and his group at Cambridge showed that there were many more faint sources than strong ones. On average, one would expect the faint sources to be more distant ones. There were thus two possibilities. Either we are in a region of the universe in which strong sources are less frequent than the average, or the density of sources was higher in the past when the light left the more distant sources on its uh, journey towards us. Neither of these possibilities was compatible with the predictions of the steady state theory that the density of radio sources should be constant in space and time. The final blow to the theory was the discovery in 1964 by Arnold Penzas and Robert Wilson of a background of microwave radiation from far beyond our galaxy. This had the characteristic spectrum of radiation emitted by a hot body, though in this case the term hot is hardly appropriate since the temperature was only 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. The universe is a cold dark place. There was no reasonable mechanism in the steady state theory to generate microwaves with such a spectrum. The theory therefore had to be abandoned.